Ladies yep. and gentlemen, welcome to Questlove Supreme. I'm your host, Questlove. We have Team Supreme with us. This is a morning episode of Questlove Supreme. So it'll be very interesting to see how the energy is mm. this morning. Because, mm. you know. Laia had two chats. She's ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> That's an instant <laughs> gif right there. <laughs> I think it's gif. It's not gif, Steve. It's gif. <laughs> Jeff is a peanut butter. Jeff is a peanut butter. Jeff is a peanut butter. Okay. Yo, man. I, what is before, it? Is it, is it before before <laughs> money died, before he passed, he told me it was Jeff. Hey, man. Uh, is this like the Uno thing? How about Steve like, Uno? Come on, man. Like, it, draw two. Right, draw two. <laughs> I get it. All right. All right. I, I'll, I'll roll with the mob. I'll you knew the creator GIF. of the GIF? The creator of the GIF. Like he he was one of the early people to die in the pandemic, but the last thing we did together, some awards thing, and I asked him. I didn't even ask him. He says, "Jim." I was like, "How do you know I was going to ask you?" <laughs> like I get asked this hundred times a day. So, <laughs> but then he also said I should have said "gif," but yeah, or used a J if you if you wanted it to. Uh, anyway. I, I, yeah. I get it. It's he's it's it, it's above him now. So you know mm -hmm. he's not here. So we're he's above us now. He's maybe. <laughs> 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 oh God! All right. So Bill, how you how you doing, man? New boss. Hold Bill. on. I just I just googled. It said he called it a GIF with a soft G. Choosy developers, he said, choose GIF. This was of course a play on the peanut butter brand GIF's line. Choosy yeah. mothers choose GIF. That's yeah. all. And the internet never lies. So I'm going GIF. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm fine, by the way. Thank you very much for asking. Well, yeah. And thank you. And, and Steve? Yes, I'm good. <laughs> Fonte? I'm good, man. I'm good. Been working. Uh, me and uh, just did something. Oh, yeah. Then, yeah, what uh, are you working on? I'll, well, I'll let, well I, I, I don't know how much I'm at liberty to say, so I'll let uh, William Bill. I'll explain. Uh, 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 what Fonte, it happened once. Tell us what it happened once. Fonte and his producing partner Zoe have created a jam for the children that will air sometime in September by a very famous, fantastic artist. It actually on the filmed Strizzy? Two, on the Strizzy. It films today, but we're not uh, allowed to say who that person is, other than uh, it's going to be awesome. Say wrote an Elmo jam. Yeah, I've been writing jams. I've been writing. Jam. You're living the dream. <laughs> Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, um, I I will say that our guest today, um, well, it's an understatement to say that she is a monster talent, uh, as talented as they come. Uh, she's an un unworldly singer. You know, there's there's people that that ooze with charisma. we our careers are borderline neck and neck. So since the roots have been, that you like twenty years older, but that's okay. Yeah, but like I just started late. Um, if my memory serves me correct, whenever the roots would come to the Bay Area, uh, I I believe that this person has been kind of a, a a presence in the entirety of my career, and even from the first moment we've laid eyes on her, like just absolute charisma. Like she she owned the stage, and that's that's something that you can't find anywhere. Uh, and and pretty much in entertainment like that's a special gift uh as of now as we speak um her 11th album entitled good life uh has just been released uh, by the time now. it gets on air it should have been out by then um so in addition to uh, a grammy award winning music career in multiple genres she's also an actress of stage and screen don't forget an author um an educator and an advocate for others um and this is a long time coming. So welcome to QLS. Today we have Lettucey. Welcome to uh, Thank you? you so much. Well, what, that means a lot just hearing you talk <laughs> about me. Because <laughs> I see you DJing all the time. You know, I would always go to your shows. That's like one of my favorite things. I know that, this that. is the thing. As long as we've known each other, like we've never had a moment to really just chop it up like in a real way. So this is almost like our first real in-depth conversation, even though, you know, I, I, again, it's it's been several decades and, mm -hmm. you know, this is a long time coming. Uh, well, I'll ask you because, you know, today is the, is the what, what I say, the birth day 
of your new album. Do you still get excited about these things as if it were like a, your children out in the world or like do you still get like butterflies and anticipation and excitement of presenting I, it to the world? I am so nervous right now, but really? I'm every single time. But I think this one even more so because of the growth. I'm um I'm I never chase relevancy. I it I it's not my thing. I I love growth and perseverance and uh history more than anything. And so me, I'm always adding colors to my version of whoever I am in that era and uh, hoping for people to see another side of my myself that I never get to show. Um, so this is another side of, and kind of full circle coming back to the root of feel good music, like when I started, you know? So this one, I'm, I'm kind of grown and I, I don't care what people think anymore. I just want to put feel good out there. I think we needed it. I needed it. Mm -hmm. And um, what I'm nervous about is after three years of work, is it enough? You know? Yes, it is. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, yes. I'm, I'm so glad you said that because um, right now we're going through a cycle. I mean, you'll be maybe the fourth or fifth artist that we've interviewed in which their product uh is kind of a direct result of whatever they learned from the pandemic this restart yeah. thing like it had with, with britney howard and also uh green, with green, green bailey ray, ray. ray. Yeah. yeah yeah like you're seeing these artists who uh kind of had either a pivot or a transformation or they got to know themselves better did a lot of self-work and the creativity that normally went on their product before 2020 is not the same way as it is now. So would you, would you say that for you, that's also the, the case? I think I'm a chameleon every album though. I've always been different, every project. Um, I think I did a complete pivot by doing Let Us See Sings Nina. Right. When I'm an R&B, you know me as an R&B artist, but I sing classical and in opera and in French and Italian, but I never get to show that in R&B. So to me, it's like, for me, it's how I feel. And a lot of it has to do with ownership, being my own, on, under my own label and doing my own thing. So I've never had that. The pandemic only pushed me forward to be more active in uh, socially active online and talking to people. Before I was more like, just putting stuff out and leave going away. This is a this is new for me, actually you, talking to people more. <laughs> wait, so you're not an engager? No, I try to be. I've gotten better. 2020 taught me that. I had my own podcast. I started talking more to my friends privately, but then I'm like, I might as well put this out and show people that I'm talking, you know? There no one knows and knew anything much about me, but you seeing me around, you know what I mean? I'm like the, the oh, Lettuce is at the show? What is she doing here? <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, you know what? Yeah, I see, yeah. see, for me, I would I would have thought the opposite because when you're on stage. Mm -mm, that's another thing. You do, but when you're on stage, you, you, you do this like zero to 100 in two seconds. And, you know, I'm not even trying to blow smoke up your ass or anything, but literally, like charisma, connecting with the audience, talking to the audience, engaging them, telling jokes, yeah, talking about your life, like that's a hard thing to do. Like I, I avoid it at all costs. You know what I mean? I hide behind a drum set. I hide behind turntables and the internet and all these things. Like where you have to be out there. And I, I just naturally thought there was one show I saw where I was like. I, I will be none surprised if, you know, you get an Oprah platform, just the way that you were doing one on one with your your audience. But it's weird to hear that in your personal offstage life that you're saying you're an introvert, sort of. Or you were. I'm, I'm a little bit of both, but more so introverted, really shy. Um, but so stage, though, it's I think of the audience more so. I don't think of myself. I think of them and 
making time and moments to come to the show and entertain them and be honest and authentic because I wouldn't want to pay for that. I then put myself in right. their position. Right. But what would I, if I'm sitting out there watching you guys, I want to be like this, you know what I mean? I want to feel something. So if I'm standing there like glue, just letting it dry, it's just boring. So I always think of put myself in the audience's position of coming to see me. And what can I give back? You know, I'm sorry, my phone is just going oh, crazy. Oh, okay. to turn it's, it it's record release day, you're loud. Yeah, I say for every ding you have, that's that's incredible. Congratulations. <laughs> well, look, so if you are shy in your personal life, yeah. Um, and this is something I'm just discovering maybe in the last two or three years in talking to um artists like on this platform and also just interviewing them in general. Um, I think a lot of the general public is rather shocked that some artists might have anxiety, social anxiety, that sort of thing. And so I'm often finding out that they have to sort of psych themselves up like a half hour before going on stage or like transform into a new character, that sort of thing. Like, so what is your process to get out of your social shyness of non-stage life into like, what, what, what is your process like an hour before the, before showtime? A lot of breathing. High heels does it for me. I love wearing high heels. <laughs> oh, so you become a new character when you Nobody wear shoes. Says that. That's a I love high heels. I love makeup. I be I just love transforming. The, just becoming grown woman like energy. It's so mm -hmm. good for me. It it says I belong. It says I'm worthy. It says power. And inside my heart is racing. I'm still afraid but I recycle the fear into win and gather, tell them about who you are, where you come from, the music, the root, everything. It's not, it's bigger than me, but all of that gives me power to just execute the stories. We're storytellers, we're creatives. So we gotta, it's not about us. It's about what we're trying to ignite and inspire other people. They wanna feel something. So I go back to that. And but the high heels, six inch. I should hold. On, I can go. Oh yes, yeah, please, please. <laughs> Even now, this morning, <laughs> you keep them closed. You keep them closed. Nine a.m. Yeah, this I, might be the I, first, I, the first guest I to go and rehearsal. grab their shoes. Wow. I have rehearsal. I will fight you. That is not a way. What that this is my. Ooh, this your, your poor ankles. Oh, your ankles. Dude, this is so much fun. You. That's a whole performance in those. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Ninety a minutes. It's a warrior. It's a Ninety warrior. minutes. I love I love a good hill. It makes me taller. I'm five five. I need some. Y'all are tall. I, <laughs> I'm short. <laughs> All right. So note it. Uh, I will be writing Crocs for. Uh, for, for Find her some my, nice. My, make my her some Prince nice Crocs. high Crocs, Amir. <laughs> you have some heels with Crocs. No, they act, they actually have platform Crocs. But, yeah, I have some, but they're not high know, enough for her. They don't they don't go beyond size 14. So, oh, you know, I don't know. I need my. <laughs> they, they so. But um, I'll probably reduce yeah. it down in two years. So I might as well do it as long as I can. <laughs> yeah. Watch those hips. Yeah. <laughs> ah, for real. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Uh, let us see. I, I thought you were born in the Bay Area, but I found out I was wrong. Can you tell us where you were born? I'm originally from New Orleans, Louisiana. Um, my family comes from the Holly Grove area. I don't have an accent because I moved when I was 12 years old to the Bay Area. So I was raised in Oakland, East Oakland. But when I get mad, my accent comes out really nicely. Bye <laughs> 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 <So, laughs> bye. It gets right. right. Oh, that's oh. what happens. <laughs> I love a New Orleans accent. Wait, can yeah. I ask the, the question, Amir, that I feel like we might have to skip because I need to know where Lettucey. Anaba is it Anabadi or is it Anabit? Anibade. 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 I yes. need to know where Lettuce Anibade came from. It's a Yoruba word. My mom named me. It's, it, it comes from a uh, Ochosi song, a Yoruba word, uh, God. Uh, my mom loves Yoruba music and would sing it. And uh, the, that's where the name it means to bring forth uh, is Lettuce and Anibade means to bring luck. Whoa. So bring forth, bring luck. And so that's my real name. My mom and dad named me. They were kind of hippies. 
and uh, that that was their thing, you know. So that's where my name comes from. Uh, that's what's up. Okay. Yeah. Um. Do you remember what was your first musical memory? My mom would sing at this park across the street with her band. Um, and she had this big afro and bell bottoms, blue jean bell bottoms and a green shirt and some big hoops. And she had this tambourine, but she would hit it with her hip all the time. Mm -hmm. And I just loved every time her hip would move or she'd sing, the audience would just, I just saw them go crazy. I didn't know what that meant, but the sound of her voice always would do something here. So that memory always, I always remember that before I go on stage. And, but that was my, one of my first memories of music. The other one is the A track, the band would record to the A track and it would sit in our room. We had a shotgun house that just goes straight ahead. And in the living room, the band would record in the living room and my mom would record her vocal part with the A track in our bedroom, which was the next room. So I would stare at the A track and watch my mom record on the edge of the bed. And then when it when they press play and her voice came out of it, I was just blown away. Those two memories, I, that's when I wanted to sing. Did your mother, did she like make records? Was she a recording artist or did she just sing? Like yeah, she was a recording artist. She had her own band called um, Car Nova in New Orleans. They had their own band. It was interracial, racial, uh, bass player, guitar. My stepdad played drums. That's why I started on the drums. That's why I love watching drummers. That's why I became a fan of That's America. why we're friends. Okay. Yeah. You're, <laughs> I, 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 I would watch the way drummers set up their snare. Is it slanted? Is it low? Is it below their knees? Like every little technical thing. So I started on the drums and uh, I would watch them perform, rehearse in our bedroom, but we were too young to go in the club. So they would have the car close to the side door so that my mom can babysit while performing so she would d do double duty so i'm i'm a you know kid from that kind of era where they did a lot of uh performing and uh recording at the same time but she had her own band lead singer and her and the bass player would uh write songs together all the time wow i, I know you're probably uh obsessed with darby jones if you're trying to figure out drum angles <laughs> <laughs> Because I'm still trying to figure that out. Set up, yeah. right? That setup is crazy. <laughs> I was like, okay. Um, are you still drumming now? Like, do you, can you still? I do paradiddles on a pad when I get nervous or things like that, but not, nah. The band always trying to make me play, but I won't play. I told you, I get a little nerdy on certain times, and that's one of them. I don't want to play in front of. I know like an African beat and a James Brown beat. That's all I know right now. <laughs> you, don't think, you don't think your audience would go crazy if you just suddenly started? I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> just give us yeah. a little, especially because you know, Afro beats, let's go. You think I can do it? I, I'm I know you can do it. You know you can do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Do you own a drum set? No, I think when we get a bigger house, I'll get one. But right now, I'll wait. I have a I have a Rhodes. It's right there. I'm 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 sending you a drum set. Really? What? Well, yeah, you're also helping me because you know I'm a hoarder, and yeah, the less <laughs> the less boxes I have. Well, if you send it, I'll practice and then I'll play and record. Oh, I'm it. not bullshitting you. I'm trying to get rid of these boxes. I'm giving you a drum set. So. <laughs> Well, thank you. I appreciate it. I love hey, the drums. I've you know, started I more my monitors, Amir, the, the rim shot, the snare and the kick, and my vocal. That's it. That's all I have in my, my monitor ears. Everyone's like, you're crazy. I'm like, I need the beat. Yeah, I know this. No, this this is great. I I, I encourage this highly. I encourage this. <laughs> what was the first uh, album that you owned? First album I owned, Thriller. Thriller, Purple yes. Rain was there. Those two was what I had, but Thriller was the allowed to listen to Purple Rain. I snuck it in. Oh, okay, yeah, I was going to say yeah. to sneak it in. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think we've had one guest on the show that was like freely allowed to listen to Prince uh, in their childhood. Like Prince wasn't contraband. 
And After the it. movie, they let it go because we had saw the movie. It's a wrap, you know. Oh, but Thriller was the one that was the. That was okay. Oh. Uh, what about your first concert? I didn't. You know, my during my time, we couldn't go. It was Run DMC, and uh, who was it? Run DMC. The Fresh Fest. It was yes. We couldn't go. I couldn't oh. go. It was, my parents wouldn't let us go. So I had my little general electric radio and I would just play the cassette on the porch and just listen like that. And pretend. And okay. pretend like we were there. But I didn't <laughs> go to a concert until I was in college. And the first Wait, concert. What? Yes. Didn't never, had never been a concert. My first concert was Diane Rees opening for George Benson. Wow. At the Sonoma, uh, up in Sonoma somewhere. It was a, a date. This guy took me on a date. That's how I got to go to a concert. Crazy, right? It's funny you said that because for some reason, uh, three days ago, what was the, what was the song about grandma? Um, uh, better oh, days. Better days. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I don't know why I had this need to hear that song. Like it was always on radio when I was in high school. Really. Wow. Oh my god! Eight, that, eight, like eight, I forgot eight. there was a time in which like Diane Reeves had like the number one song on Power ninety nine, like, mm -hmm. yeah. and that wow. was the thing that also it was like that record music. and uh, also kind of uh, Piano in the Dark by Brenda Russell. Oh like, yeah, Brenda Russell. Yeah, yeah. Era those. Oh, well, that Russell. still gets played on like Piano in the Dark has has traveled to well, I don't call it yacht rock radio, but whatever. Like yeah, yeah. <laughs> Wherever, when you're in CVS at, at three in the morning. <laughs> it's one of the best albums of all time. It is. The Russell album. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is. Tell us about your, your musical development. Like, do you have any siblings or is it just you? I have an older sister, a younger sister. And on my dad's side, I have 11. I have 11 and I'm, I think I'm 12. I'm 12 in there in that mix. So that's 12. Sorry. I have Get it right. Um, I know you're interviewing, but I wanted to ask you about when we uh, did the uh, VH1 Anita Baker. Oh, I'm going to get to that. I'm going to oh, get okay. to that. You've I'm been sorry. Waiting. <laughs> that is. All right. All right. Let's just have it now. Let's go. I'm skipping. Yeah. Oh. All right. I'm no, just trying to ramp up to this. Perfect segue. Um, because <laughs> as an artist, the two things that I look forward to most in life is when someone puts me on to an album mm -hmm. that will later like change my life and all that stuff. So, I mean, I've had that a few times, uh, you know, like Jill handing me her record. Oh shit. Fonte handed me his, you know, the, the little brother album or yeah, that know, record, Blau or whatever. But the only thing that tops that for me is when I, witness a star is born moment now we're doing um vh1's uh it's not women who rock it's it's divas is it divas was it divas i think i i can't remember yeah i think it was divas R yeah divas r&b divas though r&b about... divas uh I've, I've told many stories of whenever i'm put in those situations in which you got to curate a bunch of artists that's the first time, like even before Hip Hop 50, that's the first time I had to learn that it's not just about music, but you also have to manage artists in general. Personalities. Personalities, which I didn't know. Um, now, the first half of this story kind of isn't mine to tell. With seconds left on the clock, and when, or when I say seconds left on the clock, I mean, you know, in TV world, one should at least thoroughly kind of, you know, at least have three, a minimum of three hours of working out kinks and whatnot. I mean, we probably had all of 27 minutes before we started taping. And, you know, we have a, a giant gaping hole of space left that, that needed to be filled, which is who's going to. Now I'll sing Sweet Love. Now I realize that, yeah, you're telling the truth about your shyness because you kind of there. I don't, was was Sandra there as well, or was it just you? It, it, it was just, it, no, it was me and Sandra. Yeah, because I had never done a tribute ever on television. That was like right. the first. 
Now, correct me if I'm wrong. What were you initially there for? I was initially there to sing uh, with another artist, I think. Okay. I'm trying to remember. Uh, Shirley, Shirley. Was it Shirley? Shirley I Jones, I think. Oh, Shirley Jones. That entire that entire day was after that moment, it was the most surreal moment of Sharon my life. Jones. All I remember was Sharon Jones. Sharon Jones. Jones. Sharon Jones, yes. Oh, okay. What I do remember was I, I didn't go to you first. I think I went to Sundra. Mm. No, and you went to Marsha, right? Was it Mar Oh, you went to Sundra to talk to her. Yes. Right. I mean, well, she was there in proximity because she was also like there. Were you there to watch the the rehearsal? Yeah, we, we were trying to watch rehearsal and then we got kicked out of a room and we went back to our dressing room and right. stayed out of the way, which is what I love to do. Because I'll, I'll go wait. Away. I don't know if I ever shared this part of the story. The the initial plan for that moment was was in motion. Like both artists were on stage and versing their parts and whatnot. And then the moment this was this was the this is the craziest rogue moment of all time I've ever witnessed an artist do. Uh, and I'm respectfully recapitulating the story. So you are so respectful right now. I can't even I'm understand so the story. Glad you are. Look, after, you are so after respectful. I'm, I'm losing my mind. I'm like, I need to get the less respectful remix of yeah. the story. Look, I, look, I know that we're, we're about that, but I've already been roasted by another artist. Uh, you gotta be careful. <laughs> by her other group members, her other group members. I was the oh. whipping boy, and I I had nothing to do with it. You know, again, it's it's above me. But okay. anyway, the whole point was that there was a moment right after the bridge in which the song started to go rogue, and Anita Baker decided that this moment's not going to go down. But the way that she sort of finessed us, and she literally like so go after the bridge of sweet love, like, and she's walking down the stairs, she's singing, and. Then she puts her coat on and she's still singing the song. Oh, and then we get to the chorus and she's putting a pocketbook on. And then she's like walking down to the audience. You know, we're camera blocking and all that stuff. Yo, she sang the last of those ad libs, walked out the door, hailed the cab, and went straight to the airport. Like, but that was rehearsal though, right? That was, a, I mean, it was it was camera blocking for a show we were going to shoot in two hours. But I've never like a, the the average person would have been like, "Hey, stop the song, guys." Um, I appreciate this, but I cannot do this. I'm leaving. Goodbye. She didn't do that. Like she literally sang the song, and then like the way Mister Rogers like puts his sweater on. And she put a coat on. Did you see this, Lexi? Did you see? Did you see yeah, this? Oh, no, I wasn't in the room. We were kicked. We were kicked out way before the song even started. Oh, you were kicked they out. Wanted, yeah, they wanted. I got practice. it. It was. Yeah, it was a lot of drama. And but seriously, when she, I, mean, I think at one point she had gum in her mouth like this, like she put her pocketbook on and all that stuff, and. <laughs> But still doing it verbatim. Sweet, da, 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 sweet, da, da, don't nobody know. And then she was like, in the vest of you. She left the theater, still singing with the microphone. Love that Amir. In the vest of you. And then she walked out of the Hammerstein ballroom. And I'm looking at Nelson George like, wait, what's going on here? Hey, James, James, James. Wait, James Poison. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Wait, wait, James, stay. Make him stay. Make him stay. Oh, wow. James. Yes. Were you with us? Were you Just with guess. us for VH1 Divas? Oh man, brain. Anita. Shut up. <laughs> Do you not remember that moment? Uh, I think I do suffer from old man brain. <laughs> I think you know, James, that you're just James. afraid to. Good, good call, James. Good call. <laughs> Wait, I think I remember hearing about this. Oh, was that it? I, when she James, sang and she was walking out the building. you not playing keyboards. Who else would play keyboards? Yeah, I don't know either. I can't. I don't Ray know. Angry you, wasn't in the loop like that. It was that you were definitely there. It was a long time ago. Maybe it was Omar. It was. I do. And yes, so, sound. Oh yeah, I do remember that. <laughs> Wait, what? I'm, just I feel like I'm okay. having. I'm feeling like I'm having a little boy that cried wolf moment <laughs> because I'm he needs a witness. James. The he way that Anita Baker left the stage. Yes, I never. 
I've never seen someone yes, he loves you. walk off the stage, <laughs> still singing, yes. grab her coat, still singing her pocketbook, <laughs> chew the stick of gum, and literally <laughs> ad-libbed herself into a cab, went to the airport, and I asked oh Nelson George, God, I'm like, wait, wh what happened? And he was like, she went home. And I was yeah, like, she I, left I, her luggage. Like, she literally. I do remember that. I do. I distinctly do remember that. Can I just say, when you asked before, when you, when they said the room started buzzing around that she left. <laughs> yes. And we were backstage going, what's going on? And they mm -hmm. were like, no, Anita Baker left. I was like, what? I wanted to meet her. Why did she leave? She coming back though, right? <laughs> they were like, no, she's not coming back. They're trying to call her. So I, it, and when you came to my room to ask me about singing it, when you finally showed up, I was like, why is Quest Love coming to my room? What'd I do? And I thought I was in trouble. I was, I didn't do anything. And then you came in and explained we need So here's some, the thing. I can see him now. But, I, but this is the thing I didn't tell you is that after you asked me, I called AB, Queen Anita Baker and said, can you please come back? <laughs> we would Wait love. Wait a minute. To. And yes, she said, even after you asked me, because I felt, you know, I love honoring our greats no matter what. And if you ask me to do their song, I always call them and say, hey, I'm going to be performing your song. That's just something I do. But I felt weird a little bit. So I called her and said, hey, are you all right? Just checking on you. Uh, she's like, I'm fine. I'm going home. <laughs> I was like, she didn't Without tell her me luggage. What, she didn't uh, tell me what went on. She didn't say anything. She just said, baby. Wow. I said, well, they're asking me to sing your song. And I, I was hoping you would sing it. And I hope she wasn't thinking that you put me up to that. That was mm. just me saying, please come back. Cause it's BH1 and it was she the was kids okay. to see you, you know? And she was like, do a great job, honey. You're gonna be great. <laughs> But you like, oh. And that's all I heard. And I didn't ask her what went on. It was none of my business to know. Mm -hmm. My job mm -hmm. was trying to get her to come, come back. And because uh, I knew a whole nother generation wanted to see that because she hadn't been on, on television a long a time. It was a big event mm -hmm. to see that. Hey, P.S., uh, just real quick, because I know he's going to try to get out of here like Peter on The Family Guy. Um, James Poisner, can we get your commitment to being a guest on Questlove Supreme in the next two months, please? Don't you mean Homer Simpson? <laughs> oh, Homer Simpson. I'm sorry. You're right. Wrong guy. <laughs> Slow mo <-mo> <laughs> Do it again, James. How, how, much how much y'all paying? <laughs> the same thing. We're going to pay you the same thing we pay at Lettucey. We're going to pay you the same thing. Promise. <laughs> Wait a minute. Didn't James do an episode already? No, he, he always does. He, he, he was a sidekick. Him. Fred Hammond. Yeah, I was Fred a sidekick Hammond. with uh, Fred Hammond. Okay. When he was in, he was in his Sam Ash basement. Remember? <laughs> right. <laughs> this is special. Like, anyway, we don't I'm, get no I'm James. Glad, I'm glad James was Love there. You, There's this sort of rosy <laughs> ending to this thing, and the whole thing was that when I, I think Sandra was next to me, and I asked, I see Sandra. I think she said, or someone from your team was like, "Oh." Leslie knows that song like the back of her hand. She she will kill that. Well, song. I'm a Anita Baker fan. She's also one of my greatest mentors and friends. I love it, AB. There might be things, you know, to me, every artist has a thing. They have their mm -hmm. quirk and what they need and require to be comfortable. I don't mm -hmm. know what the situation was. I'm just saying everybody got a thing. They got quirks. You but know, you, you wasn't even going there with this conversation. What was your no, original? <laughs> I wanted to know for Amir doing that kind of show, the mass, it was so massive with so many women, mm -hmm. iconic R&B, uh, like it was R&B and soul that night. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It was huge for me. And I wanted to ask him having that, con that control over that kind of playlist and all these artists and one room what was that like for How you stressful I, I well you answered it but i but that's why i wanted to bring it up like because i that was the first time oh, i yeah. saw come out of being the drummer to being a could like a conductor a ranger a whipping bag <laughs> you want to know something funny though yeah. want to know something funny that was the second most stressful moment of the night because yeah. i had another situation backstage with uh, a Motown legend um, whom like drummers are always 
drummers will always get the the no no pun intended the short end of the stick um mainly from singers who now i understand that if there's certain insecurities uh sort of uh lying under um it might come usually when a person wants to micromanage tempo or mm. that's not right da -da 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 there's another issue at hand you know that that's mm. not about the song's too fast or you're playing it too slow so you know i was dealing with another drama with a motown legend that just kept decided i was going to be the the she browbeat me and she did it something so smooth like i'm drumming behind her and at one point she saw she sings something sings the chorus and turns around and says kill me oh no <laughs> r&b is a whole nother beast it has you know this amir it's a different right so no just to let you know that like that 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 situation with Benita was sort of like that was in second place to something else okay. I was dealing with. Um Ow. it taught me it taught me be careful what you ask for. And also <laughs> I'll say that surviving that prepared me for hip hop fifty. And I was women, thinking that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You know, I, I've told our listeners that uh, you know, I've lost a body part uh because of the stress of that. But that's also me, one. that's also me not, you know, advocating for myself and Volunteering to be a a, a whipping boy, but what, I, what, what body part did you lose? What, yeah, I, was like, <laughs> I said not them. That's why I said them. The main one. Is good, I told y'all my tooth fell out. Oh, oh that's oh, right. Okay, because oh, okay. okay. you gotta be. You know, we all smoke and drink, so we be forgetting. Y'all so, faces at the camera. You <laughs> You know, we gonna roll with our brother, but you know, we, we still yeah, let him know that it's an off. But solidarity only goes so far. Let me put the cherry on top and say. That you came out with 27 minutes left. You ran through that song. And it was the most beautiful thing ever. Even to the detriment of not seeing that magic moment happen. What that taught me was, one, I said to myself, like, wow, like, I rarely see an artist that's, like, ready for their close-up. And for mm -hmm. me, that was a star is born moment. Because... Mm -hmm. Yeah. The way did you look at your your trending topic? Like you were trending number one when that aired. It was as if people just discovered you for real, and it was such a moment where I was like, "That's that's the way it was meant to be." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I I honestly I was scared to death, and I mm -hmm. because I didn't have time to do what I normally do, prepare, overthink. I know overthink, and you just also, did it. Marsha Ambrosius did it too. And I was happy to have her there as well to help sing part of the uh, other part, but you were like so happy. I was honored to finish out what you had started and do my best, but I, I was freaked out. But Easy. I did try to get an AB back, I did. I didn't know what was going on. I was out the dark, out of the room, still don't know what happened, but I'm you, just happy. You rose to the occasion. Now, you guys, are y'all sure this is your face though that night? Well, that's why I wanted to ask why it was so. How was it for you? Because your face was, you were wore out. Um, <laughs> yeah, I didn't know about you did meditation. A wonderful job. You did a wonderful job. I have Thank to you. say, y'all, is this the BET Awards 2018? No, it was VH1. So you didn't sing Anita Baker's Sweet Love a couple times. I did, but I didn't do. I did it first with Amir. With okay, I'm making sure because I I know people are listening. And they're like, "How? Which one is? I want to find it." Not that. So it. Yeah, okay. it was the first tribute I had ever done. I, I I do a lot of tributes, but that was the first one, on a big platform like that. But yeah. it was all R and B people, soul R and B. The the lineup was incredible. I couldn't believe I was there. I was still R and B dealers. Yeah. Right? So did you notice there. a paradigm shift after that moment? Absolutely. Tell me about it, because I I still maintain that, you know, one, you trended the entire night it was on. And just reading all the comments, like people were really engaged with how you handled it and they loved it. So what what happened after that moment? They were I my shows got bigger. Um, more people started 
wanting to know more about me, but I wasn't really social. Like, like I said earlier, we didn't have enough of that. I didn't even know what trending was. I was too busy surviving as an independent artist, mm -hmm. you know, but I noticed in the club environment, more people were coming out to my shows after that. And there was a level of respect, but I also got called to do more tributes. So it kind of opened the door for that, which I was like, what is going on? And I, I and it was that. Who are your North stars in terms of, uh, you know, who you look uh, to as far as like your, your vocal idols or like, who, who do you seek inspiration from? I wanted to be an opera singer. So Leontine was one of the biggest, uh, Dinah Washington, because there would be no Aretha without Dinah. She was a big influence for Aretha. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course, Aretha Franklin, because she could sing, she sung, sung everything. Um, and I love, uh, my mother was a huge influence. It starts at home for me. She had the most beautiful soprano voice. And when she had cancer in the throat and she survived it and won, but she, her voice got lower. She was worried. I said, mama, you gonna sing, you can sing a alt, good old alto and tenor. You'll be fine, <laughs> you know? So, but she's one of my biggest inspirations is my mother because without her, I wouldn't have been introduced to all these other vocalists. And I love Patsy Cline. She's another wow. big voice storyteller. We forget country is like, not that everybody's having that country talk. I've been on it. My mom listened to Willie Nelson and 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 Bob Dylan. I was like, mom, why do you, they can't really sing? She's like, it's the stories, oh. you know? She's like, wow. the stories are the thing. So I'm, I was the nerdy weird kid that liked all the opposite. I didn't start okay. in the church. I, I got the church stuff later when we moved to Oakland and I met the, the Hawkins and Daryl Coley and mm -hmm. learned that Daryl Did you Coley, go to their church? No, my mom did, she was in their choir. So we would, I would visit here and there, but I wasn't a church, I'm not a church girl. I love the nerdy, wow. was, we were raised Catholic. So we were mom, mom, me, mom, mom, mom. You know, we didn't <laughs> do all the squalling. I learned all of that because Tremaine said, come on, baby, squall. And I was, my mom grew up Baptist, so I heard her voice. That's where I got it from. Do you know what I mean? I'm the- you know Tremaine you know, Hawkins? I, yeah, she taught me how to do my first squall. She was in the studio. You go like the- and What she is a squall? squall? Yeah, all that. <laughs> <laughs> you asking for you it know. early in the morning, I ain't doing that now. But you well, know- wait, if doing. you know Tremaine, have you ever met Lynette? Stevens Hawkins? Oh, absolutely. Met her as well. What's she like, man? Like, just listen to all her records. Like, you never see press on any of them. So oh, she she's she had her own church, so they're really quiet, you know? They they're nerds like well, I can't say like us, but yeah, I guess they like us. All right. But um okay. yeah, yeah, I can't okay. <laughs> but yeah, they they're really quiet. But, you know, people who are love the music and they keep it there. They love being private as well. It's not all of us like to be in the front. I'll say that the number one scene that I really regret that I had to drop. What? Um, in Summer of Soul was, I mean, yes, they talked me off the ledge and I put Oh Happy Day in, but really there was, oh, a, there, there was a, a solo between uh, Tremaine, Walter and Lynette when they were teenagers when they were, uh, you know, like uh, 19 years old. So that's one of the scenes I had to drop. Yeah, so I wanted to give you that billion dollar check, but you didn't say anything, so I just wrote it off the <laughs> No, dang it. You know what I wanted to say? <laughs> you know what I love about Summer of Soul? But I'm, Luther Vandross is a huge influence. Why didn't you put Luther Ooh, that's such there? a good question. Because, um, Luther was, was a, an 18-year-old nobody, air quotes. Um, nobody taped it. They didn't record it. A local it singer. And they were like, well, we're running out of tapes. So, you know, yeah. that, that local yeah. Harlem band with Luther Vandross and Fonzie Thornton and yeah. practically Luther's whole entire crew from Listen to My Brother. Um, Oops. They, yeah. They, <laughs> well, the... Also, the weird thing was the same the same people that shot uh, Summer of Soul were also the same people that shot the pilot of Sesame Street. And so to them, Luther was just like, L Luther was the first musical guest on 
Sesame yes, Street sir. because of the band he was in singing about the number 20. Right. So to them, he was just like a local Yoko and local Yoko. Oh, OK. Yeah, okay. they okay. real close. Some words. Trust me, I. I searched high and low. There, there was no uh, uh, good footage of Luther at all. The last time we had a, a singer of your uh, caliber or your vocal uh, prowess, I'll, I'll say, that's one of the unfortunate episodes in which the audio didn't work. Oh my God, you're gonna do no, do, do, wait, are you talking to, don't do that. You're talking about- I just saw, well, you're saying it. I, I was just fine leaving it where it was. I am not in this. So I'm gonna ask, so I'm gonna ask again, I want you to not not dispel a myth, but the way that singers have these very specific requirements for their their vocal to be open. I'm very cynical and I believe that's psychosomatic, but I've heard like Fonte clap back every now and then by saying like, no, that's real. But can you explain you to me? What is the deal with like with artists that are, you know, they can't have air conditioning on because they're it's broke my clothes or up. this is real. It your vocal cords will clam up from the cold air. I have gotten sick. I remember singing what was it called? Biscuits and blues in New York, whatever that is. Uh, Where's that it, at? It was a. I want some biscuits club. and blues. Right? It was some some blues <laughs> like right club. Now. But it's closed now. Okay. I literally, the air conditioning was right here blowing into my face. As I'm opening my mouth, it just dried my vocals out. Mm -hmm. And you can hear as I'm singing the show, my voice slowly go away. Cracks, everything. It, I said, can you turn the air off? They wouldn't turn it off because it was too, it was underground. It was a club in New York on Broadway. But I can't remember it, the name of it, but it's gone now. But it was it, it it just took my vocals out and we had to stop the show. It, it's better when it's warm. It keeps it fluid. You have uh, the I don't want to sound gross, but you need it to be, to be wet in there. <laughs> you need water. You need moisture. You need you need your vocal cords. They, they're really thin and they have to flap. You should know. <laughs> this. Come on with the wet. I don't sing. I yell. <laughs> You yell? Yeah, you do no, yell. Well, I've heard no. you yell many times. <laughs> no, but it's just I I I don't know. Just there's certain I'll look at the writers of singers and you know, some things I'll I'll know, like, okay, well, they need lemon and honey and da 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 whatever. Yeah, I don't but, do any of that stuff, but yeah, I get it too. So do you have a warm up process before you get on stage or yeah, I don't talk at all. I do the Celine Dion thing. My room is at 80, 80 degrees, like Luther Drop and Aretha. What about uh, the sweats, though, Lynn? The sweat. Yeah, the sweat is good. It, okay. I sing all the high notes. Fonte knows, he knows. It just feels good. It makes you ready to go. Oh, it's funny. Fonte do be sweating, and it'd be hot when I go see him sing on stage. That might be true. <laughs> yeah, man. And mm -hmm. then I have a um, steamer. I steam my vocal cords. See, that's heat. And it's making it loose and everything. It opens all your chest. It's kind of like when you put vapor rub all over and it goes, Phew. that's how you want your vocal cords to stay open. So it is a real thing for me. The good ones, the real singers do that kind of stuff. <laughs> the ones an... that, that sing like classical, they, they don't like all that. Because by the time you're um... on the stage too, it's freezing cold. So you might as well stay warm. So that's what I do. Okay. And I don't drink a lot of liquids. And I, um, yeah, I, the steaming is incredible. I also, opera singer turned me on to the citron tea that's really good. But I, lo I love that. Man, I had another question for you, but I can't find Wait, it. Wait, I got a I question got a, for you. I, oh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah. My question, let us see, like you, you transitioned to theater, like all your theatrical work, both in solo shows and Carolina yeah. Change and blah, blah, blah. What, what was the impetus behind that? Why, why go there? To survive, to pay bills. <laughs> In, in uh, the Bay Area, before I became an artist that you know as Lettuce See, I was waiting tables and working at a place called Beach Blanket Babylon where you wear these big hats. I auditioned when I was 18 years old, right out of high school. And I was going to college at the same time working in theater. And luckily with theater, I learned how to reach past four rows 
and mm. not just perform right here. I, now I, I can fill the whole room with my voice and all that because of theater. But I had to do it to pay bills, to survive. I was waiting tables at the same time after my theater gig, I leave at 1130 and go rush to my gig that everybody would go see me underground at Cafe du Nord with 100 people in the room. So they would wait for me for two hours and I would rush there after doing a theater gig with full makeup on <laughs> so that I can pay bills, do what I love and do what I need to do at the same time. So did you finish why... school? Huh? Did you finish school? No, I did not. I did. Where'd you go? I went to um, Cal State Hayward and I studied at UC Berkeley in the summers during high school. So that, cause I, like I said, I'm a nerd, <laughs> loved all that uh, classical music there. That's where I studied, but uh, yeah, I never finished because I had to survive, I had to pay bills and be, I left home at 18. Like I said, I left home mm -hmm. at 18 and uh, took care of myself and school and waiting tables. But theater was, I love acting because I did it in high school and to be able to do cabaret shows. And then it, I was gonna quit the music industry because I had been in it for as an independent artist for two years and nothing, I just kept spending all my money. And when I was quitting, I only had two suitcases in a house that I got a commercial off of doing a Sprint commercial at the time when Sprint existed. Mm, what year is oh, it? Sprint? Yeah, it's Sprint back in the day. But I That's just right. saying, time is on my side. And I got paid. Hello? Around what year was this? Commercial. Huh? Around what year was this? What time? This was like around 2000 and, man, was it 2002? Oh, okay. Okay. 2002 or three after 2003. Yeah. Because feeling orange had came out after that. Gotcha. Oh, so you didn't have to audition for that. They found, they just knew you, they knew your voice and they were like, hey, well, I was still, I was teaching during the day sometime middle schools and going, carrying instruments around. I mean, I was trying to make money. You're on your own, but I would also audition for voiceovers to do children's books and children things. And uh, I ended up getting that Sprint commercial that way through someone who, hey, what you, a friend of mine needs a voice for this. I didn't know what it was for. I just sang it. And then the little checks start rolling in. I was like, hallelujah. Oh, so I had checks. <laughs> the best wait. checks there are. Can't oh, wait. God. Residual so checks. That, you know, that's, that's that how I made my living was teaching and waiting tables and it's, it's crazy and doing gigs late at night and cabaret shows. Yeah. So first of all, that means that you, I feel like people, the people act like the first time they saw you on screen acting was the, the I want to say the Nina short that you did, the oh, four the, women. The, the, oh yeah. Yeah. Right. With uh shout out to Lisa Cortez and Gabby Sidibe, yeah. right. Who were yeah, yeah. behind that. that but for you, yeah, talk about that. I wanted you to talk about that because I was like, did that come first? And then the Nina album, like you and Nina got some things going on. Well, the first, uh, Gabby was inspired by my Nina Simone tribute that I did with Black oh. Girls Rock. Okay. So that was the, the second time I ever been on television was doing another tribute. And I came in saying, I want to be Peaches. Um, I, I was like, I got to do the Peaches part. And they could have kicked me out. You know what I mean? But I was like, I knew what part I wanted to sing. And it was me, Jill Scott, Marsha Ambrosius, and uh, Kelly Price. So I sang Peaches and then Gabby said, the writer and Gabby and a couple of producers, they were saying they were inspired by that and they wrote me into that short. And they always wanted me to play that role later. And years later, I would meet Gabby um, just in, in passing with Lee Daniels hanging out. And she said, I got a part for you. And that was the role in the, the, the four women uh, short that we did. It was amazing. Yeah. Gabby's a great director. Oh. That, uh, that debuted too at a uh, black star. Shout out to Maori too. Yeah. Dope. So, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. So speaking of which, um, can you talk about, uh, the, uh, the moments that led up to you playing, uh, Mahalia Jackson and remember me and what that was like? Wow. Mahalia. Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Um, I said no to that role a couple of times, but the, I, I love. Um, Why did you say no initially? Because I had did it in Selma, mm -hmm. you know, the little slip snippet I did and I wanted to, so many other people were doing it. So I didn't want to 
be a part of that, you know, mm -hmm. um, the Mahalia thing, because I already did it. And uh, I wanted, I, there's another role I wanted to do one day. So I was just waiting for a bigger debut, you know, but I love the director so much. Um, Erica. Erica, the producer too. Okay. I mean, the whole team, Erica is amazing. I just wanted to be a part of it uh, after I met them. We met on a Zoom and I said, that's it, I, I gotta do it. And uh, ended up doing it. It was amazing to, to, to dive into Mahalia. We had so much in common, like being from New Orleans, but transported into another city and then coming, trying to come back to pour into New Orleans. And mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was just amazing role to sing, but it was, it was enormous because you have, you have to sing gospel music and they don't play at all with anointing. You know what I'm saying? So it, it wore me out. And then I had to gain a little weight because the director wanted me a little, you know, he, she said, Mahalia was bigger. And when I saw Summer of Soul, I said, oh, wow. I had never seen her like, you know, that like move. You, you gave us her. And mm -hmm. I was, and I was so happy. My heart, I was like, there she is. And I, before I did even sell my visitor grave, like I said, I told you I honored ancestors. I was in New Orleans. I said, I want to know more about her. I was researching and I went to her grave and visited her and thanked her. And then, you know, that's when I got Selma and, uh, here she is again like the ancestors to me they call uh i let i let stuff happen to me i just do the work and get out the way that's why i got nina that's why i got trip all these tributes they just happen and i don't ask for them i say no too all the time i say no 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 right. and then just you have to do the work finish finish the work is there I a favorite worried. experience i just wanted to know because you you did mention a couple times that you've been called to, to honor a few times, but I just got to know, like, was there a favorite experience and, and, and why? My two favorite tributes I've ever done is Shaka. And it, it resic, it's still Shaka, that Shaka tribute, people are still talking about it. You can go online now. No, I, I seen it live. I just forgot because I smoked, but I got it. <laughs> <laughs> that was years ago and it's still Amazing. here. Mm -hmm. Um, that was my favorite only because she was the first person to bring me back out of quitting the business, meaning she was the first, one of the first artists, her and Rochelle Farrell, but Shaka let me open for her and gave me a gig. And that's what made me want to come back after meeting her. Cause she was like, you can't quit. There's no quitting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Just fussing. Talk and about that real quick. Like what was the decision that led up to led up to that well the industry kept saying you're not pretty enough you're not good enough you'll never make it then i went ahead and did it myself but i was spending so much money and didn't have the knowledge that i needed and we didn't have internet then and i was going, man you know i wanted to ask you about that to, to elaborate more on that like being an independent r b artist like speak about because r b generally i mean anybody you know r b is a money game I came out at a time where, you know, it's it's about who you know and who's going to give you the leg up. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a leg up. I, I would do Black Lily here and there. People would come out and see me. They didn't like the way I look. Industry really? people. Yes, uh. I did Black Lily and invited a couple of industry people. They said, well, mm. she's not a star. Damn, um, I remember when you came to those phrenology sessions too. Wasn't that phrenology? Yep. Yep, yep, you know, yep. I, I went, I hung out with Amir in the studio. That was mm -hmm. so much fun. You know what I learned from I remember. you? That, Amir, I learned from you about simplicity and more about uh, what hip hop does, why the space is so important. And yep. I never forget it. I said, Amir said, less, do less. Less is more. Less is more. And I, when I, that was my first time hearing that. And, uh, and I wow. carry, I still carry it with me today. But anyway, those things I would hope to meet people and they would help me or do a gig with me or write for me or endorse me. But really, mm -hmm. I just had to keep endorsing myself. What? I had to spend my own money to get um, a publicist hmm. and my own money to word of mouth. I would chop up flyers back in the day when they, we had Kinko's. I would do 
programs and make up my own flyers and pass them out because we didn't have internet. I would go to the flea markets. I would go to the record stores when they had record stores. Please take my CD on consignment. That's what I was doing. Me and Sandra, we would call and beg people, hey, give us a leg up, help us out. That's what I had to do. Now you get to go online, sing a song. If they like you and you have enough followers, then boom, you're relevant. That's why I stopped chasing that game. The long term for me is if I can get five people, I'm happy. If I get 10 people, I'm happy. More and more, or an artist, I, I got all the legends, they're, they're on my side. Mm-hmm. I did it gracefully. I did it in God's timing and not trying to push things to happen. Because every time I pushed, it wouldn't happen. But I always had to honor them first and say, thank you. Here's, let me sing this song and honor you. And then it brought more people in. That's the only way. And all, all the things you saw me on is because somebody believed in me. It'd be mm-hmm. one person in the room. Uh, in a like let us he should be here. The mm-hmm. only person knew me on Black Girls Rock for that four women mm-hmm. was Beverly Bond and Kim Burst. Wow. All the other people, they didn't have a clue of who I was, but they knew me from being an independent artist. And I know a lot of artists, I'm going to be honest here, that saw me and could have helped me and they didn't. I was about to ask you, how you did, how did you maintain your not being about, angry? How do you, how did you maintain? Because like, they weren't Now these me. people are singing your praises and they're like, yeah, well, I've been this why, great. Like, how do you maintain, how do you do that, Led? Is this also why you advocate? Because I know that you work with Naris in the Grammys for artists and you play a major role into that. Like yes. you've, you've had a hand in these new categories. Sorry. People don't know, like you're behind that. Is this why you also into that area? Because the Recording Academy came out, saw my independent show, said, why aren't you a member? Come be on a panel for Grammy You, the youth. Mm-hmm. I saw that they were helping the elders with advocacy, with uh, Grammy Museum, and I was blown away because I didn't want to be the industry thing. I didn't even want to be signed to a label. I did it to survive because I was going to quit. But when I did, it opened another kind of door. So when I went in the Recording Academy, all I focused on, not the Grammy, I focused on the youth. You have to. I went to Grammy U, did all the panels, and talked about my, my, my journey, rejection, recycling rejection and fear into winning. Just complete your work and do your best work. And if you get five people loving you, those five will talk about you, and it'll bring more people. And I told them about focusing on their craft and all that. I love advocating because that was me. That's how I got to study classical music. My mom couldn't afford the violin or the piano lessons or the classical lessons. She had to, someone came to our school, said we have free programs. And that's why I joined. So I'm that person now, you know. Let me go back to my question originally. So have you always been that person or did that take some self-work? Because that moment in, in knowing that you've done all this work and now, like I said, people are now like, let us see, I've been known. I've seen you. I've seen you there. Like, I, you know. But like, like, man hoes didn't want me. Now I'm hot hoes all on me. There we go. Tell me about that. <laughs> see, this is the part why I love being from New Orleans, because we are prideful people. We don't, we know we're dope, but we don't have to brag about it. Mm-hmm. We we remember what happened, but we don't have to bring it up because what we do is just take the energy and refuel it. It's a faith thing. It's a um, honor your parents thing. <laughs> don't cut up. Don't embarrass <laughs> them. <laughs> don't show off. <laughs> exactly. Come on, Mir. You know, I know me and your sister are good friends. So uh-huh. it's like we we just do our classy work. I just follow the lead of the ancestor. But on the side, yeah, we talk it but I don't want to talk about it in here. <laughs> okay, I just needed to know that you was human in that way. I'm sorry, Fonte. I am very I'm human. Petty, I'm petty tindergrass, so you know. Yeah. You Me petty. too. <laughs> mm-hmm. But a lot of people could have helped, but they didn't, but it wasn't for them to help. That's how I look at it. Every Now that Me I too. see it unfolding, it's supposed to happen this way. I'm supposed, I have so many strong relationships advocating than I do in my own industry, just being an artist from artist to artist. When you do be of service, it's the mm. best gift for 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 your career ever. 
mm-hmm. ever. So it comes back to you too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, one of your, you, you know, people that haven't helped, but one of the people that has helped, uh, Rex Rideout. Yes. One of your, on all your albums, I just see him as like, you know, someone you've always worked with. And I just want to talk about you guys' creative partnership and how it's developed over the years. Well, when I was going to quit, we were outside his garage talking and I said, that's it. You know, we met on uh, doing My Sensitivity with Boney James. Verve had a, um, a tribute for Luther Vandross they were doing. And that was the one song that Boney James had agreed to have me sing on. And he was actually telling me how to sing, which was trippy, but I did whatever he asked because that was the, 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 the session. And when they found out they came to, when Rex came to a live show, he's like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. We were telling you how to sing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then we started, I told him, you know, in private, I'm, I'm quitting. This industry is too hard. And I don't think I fit in with everybody. I'm going to go teach and be comfortable there, get a freaking health insurance, you know what I mean, chill out. And he was like, don't quit, you know, I'll help you. Would you consider signing with a label just to get in and start somewhere? Cause they are interested in you, Verve was. And here's a jazz label at the time, interested in an R&B singer. I said, I'll only do it because I'm I'm like anti B entrepreneur, you know, Mm -hmm. own your stuff. But I was like, well, I got to survive. Okay, I'll try it. He said, just record, just record. So we started recording together. We did a whole bunch of songs and Verve went crazy and wanted them. And the first song that I wrote was All Right. When I was uh, on doing Carolina Change, I wrote it and I was recording in this box on my bed with my microphone because I didn't have anything to cover the mic. So I was singing, this life can make, you know what I mean? Trying to be quiet. (laughs) On the bed, I was such a techie because I interned as a um, bedroom uh, producer. At a, yeah, exactly. <laughs> in room producer, mm-hmm. and I was techie, so I was trying to record it right for Rex. So I would send him my vocals and all of that, you know, back in the day. And uh, it, all right, blew up. Mm-hmm. Just yeah. it was the first song that came out that people got it. I told the truth. I'm, I don't know if I, this is rough out here. You know, what I, mean? I was wondering that if people walk up on you and ask you, cause you, you, you talk about relationships and self love and strength and so much. And I'm like, do people walk up on you a lot? And is that, how, is that a lot of pressure to, how girl, do you, girl, I just, I just need some advice real quick, girl, because I'm in a situation, you know, no, like, they don't do that, but they do tell me how a song has gotten, gotten them through. Okay, that's a little easier, lighter. All right is the one. uh, They love those songs. The women, I gravitate towards women a lot. That's just what it is. But um, yeah, that's I don't get the therapy questions. Okay, good. (laughs) Uh, Speaking of therapy, uh, nice segue. Iyanla Van Zant. Ah! (laughs) What is she like in real life? Because. I watched uh, Y'all Love Fix My Life. And, well, I, I mean, it used to come on. She but... is who she is on that show in person. She's the same person. Oh, my God. Direct. <laughs> and I met her. She was the first time I met her. She said, oh, you have daddy issues. You need to fix that. <laughs> just by, he- Hello. I just said hello. I just said hello. Right, ma'am, this is the Wendy's. What are you doing? Okay, we're, we're <laughs> but in front of a whole group of people. That's right. just how she is. She's direct, you know, and uh, she's like, you got to fix this. And handle that's- that. <laughs> I love her though. And I, I uh, also too, uh, but, but, um I want to ask you as well, um doing black love with your husband. What was mm. the, Oh no. Was, yo, yeah, what was the experience like? What was the aftermath? Oh, y'all did black love. love. Yeah, man. That was our we we did it during the pandemic. I always been a fan of the show. They've always asked me to be on it and I I I didn't respond <laughs> cuz I feel like you know, those parts of your, my life are, like I said, I'm private. Oh, I love keeping my, I want to stay married. I don't know about y'all. Know. You know, you Shout out to me. Philly though. He is from Philly. He is. <laughs> He's amazing too. But I'm glad we did um, Black Love because, you know, people got to see another side of me, you know, and uh, and see who I'm with. And it was great. But they, I love Tommy. Tommy is incredible. Tommy and Elaine, they're good people. They're good people. <laughs> So yeah, we did that show and I'm, that's all I'm gonna say. <laughs> Tell us the plans for the Good Life Tour that's coming up that you're about to do. Yes, in support I'm of your album. 
I'm going on a 27 city tour uh, with the great Raheem Devon is coming with me. The Good Life Tour, BJ the Sh Chicago wow. Kid will do a couple of dates when Raheem can't do it. And I'm just looking forward to it. Uh, the band, we did our final rehearsal last night and it, it just sounds so good uh, and it feels good. So I, I, I'm excited about it. I hope I'm trying to see if these heels gonna work, but we that's the ones I want. <laughs> we'll see what happens, but I'm looking forward to it. I'm gonna do a lot of, a mixture of the old and the new. Uh, the well my classics and the new a lot from the new album so i'm really looking forward to that I, I'm the, dope. Dope. the single that's why i said the single's dope too yeah. oh you like it thank yeah, you yeah i love it mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. good life that was a great project to work on it was hard but i'm happy it's out and uh again with rex i got dj camper on it again right. i love working with camper and the sell me no dreams new producer sell me no got, dreams Yes. God and uh, Joshi, I've never worked with them before. They're, I think one of them are from London. And also, and, you work with my people's Butcher Brown, too. Shout out to them. Yes, Butcher Brown. We did a song called Quality Time that I wrote with Tish um, oh, and Corey Tish. Henry. Corey Tish Henry. Tish These are our people. Tish Hyman? That's what I was thinking, too, Amir. Yes, Tish Hyman. Tish Tish Hyman and I wrote Quality Time together on the Butcher Brown tune. I've been always wanted to work with her. We've known each other for about five, six years, but we never could find a song. So I tell you, I got one. I think this is the one we should get together. I love writing with songwriters. I love sharing. She's been on this show too. I love our little Quest Love Supreme extensions. I know we got to go. Uh, thank you for uh, for doing the show with us. And you know, uh, no, thanks for having me. Thank you. I finally get to talk to you. It's I know, right? Crazy. Finally. Long time coming. <laughs> on behalf of uh, Laia and I'm Pay Bill and Sugar Steve. And Pontigolo and the great Lettucey. It's mm -hmm. Quest Love. We're signing off, and we'll see you on the next go round of Quest Love Supreme. Thank you for your support. <laughs>